Okay, so um, just to thank everybody for joining um, this seminar. Um, my name is David Henty. I said before I'm in charge of the Archer uh, training program. So I'm very glad that we've got James today giving us this talk. Uh, just a sort of brief background, I'm, I'm maybe James will cover this, but a couple of years ago, EPSRC put out a call for centers to, to bid to host tier two supercomputers. This is computers which would be um, supporting, slightly smaller than, but supporting the um, users uh, feeding up and, and supporting more diverse use than, than provided by the main Archer supercomputer, which we run here in Edinburgh. And um, there was a range of, of architectures um, 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 which were suggested and funded, but by far the most ambitious and uh, forward thinking was um, was the uh, system from GW4 who proposed using ARM uh, processors uh, together with Cray to produce, as it says here, the world's first ARM-based production supercomputer. Now, it seemed very innovative and brave back a couple of years ago. It may have seemed a bit foolhardy about a year or so ago, but um, I'm sure you'll hear now from James that they've, they've got there. They have this machine and it's an exciting uh, time because it gives us a, a diversity. As in all things, diversity is a good thing and having more than one processor architecture available in the HPC space is, is a fantastic time. So it's a very interesting time to be involved in HPC with all these new uh, new hardware coming on stream. And I'm really glad that James has agreed to tell us about their experiences on Isambard today. So I'll shut up now and hand over to James. Great, thank you, David. Uh, and thanks, David and Claire and everyone at EPCC for uh, inviting me and everyone for joining. Um, so just before I start, I'll say, if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to to uh, put them in the chat. I'll try and keep an eye on that and answer them as we go so we can be uh, relatively interactive. Uh, but yes, as, as David said, I'm going to be talking about Isambard, which is this new tier two HPC facility that will very soon be available to um, researchers from across the UK to actually get on and do some real science on. So just a bit about who GW4 is. So this is uh, the consortium behind the Isambard service. So it's four universities, that's uh, the four in GW4. So it's the universities of Bristol, which is where I'm from, along with Bath, Exeter and Cardiff. Um, and GW4 gets its name from the Great Western Railways, which are the, the rail service that connects the southwest of the UK, which is where all these universities are based. And as it happens, um, the, these railways were originally forged by this chap here on the right of the slide, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, so it's his name we've actually um, taken for the service, so it all fits together. Um, and alongside the GW4 universities, we've also got the Met Office as a partner, um, so the Met Office are also very interested in exploring uh, these technologies alongside others for their future systems, um, so they very kindly offered to host the service for us, so Isambard itself is actually sitting in the Met Office data center alongside their real production um, Cray systems that they use every day. And of course we have Cray and ARM as partners and the system, as David said, was funded um, by EPSRC. So I'm sure many of you may be already familiar with this, but just to quickly recap the, the different tiers of HPC facilities that are available to researchers, just to say where Isambard fits in. Um, so the very biggest machines, tier zero, these are um, things like the Price machines in Europe, Piz Dynt in Switzerland, um, the equivalents in the US would be things like Summit and Sierra that have been making all the headlines recently. Um, so these are big, hundreds of millions of pounds, um, hundreds of thousands of calls, so some really big systems there. Tier one is the, the national level system, so Archer of course is our tier one here in the UK, still a pretty big machine, you know, 120,000 odd calls, um, 40 or 50 million pounds, so some pretty serious um, systems at tier one as well. And then tier two are a little bit smaller, they're, they're regional, so they tend to have a, a slightly narrower scope. They're either backed by a consortia that are geographically co-located like we are in GW4 or have um, similar interests like the MMM hub one. Um, and as David mentioned, there was this call a couple of years ago from UPSRC to start up these tier twos. Um, and there was a particular focus on trying to explore different technologies for HPCs, for different processor architectures, things like GPUs and other accelerators, um, Xeon Phi, as well as um, other parts of the, the HPC systems, such as the interconnect and burst buffers and things like that. Um, so in Bristol, we've done a lot of stuff with ARM before. We were involved in the Mont Blanc project, uh, a European uh, project looking at ARM-based technologies for HPC. So we thought, yeah, the time was was just about right to start trying to do this for real. So 
there's been lots of prototype systems that have used ARM, uh, but we really wanted to try and see can we um, can we actually build a real production HPC system from ARM-based processes? So that's that's where Isambard really comes from. Um, so why are we doing this? And, and David already kind of alluded to this in the introduction, but why are we exploring ARM-based supercomputers in the first place? Um, and really, it boils down to this first point on the slide, right? There's in recent years, there's been a bit of a trend in at least the, the processes or the, the core processes that are going into a lot of HPC systems where we're losing a lot of competition. Right? There's, there's been one key vendor that's emerged as pretty much having an, a monopoly in the last few years on um, processes that are going into Linux clusters. Right? And that's ultimately not good for us. That, that Even if they're great products, ultimately, we as the end users and the consumers of those products, we need competition. right? To ensure that um, different vendors are competing for our business, so that you know, prices come down, so that there's uh, competition in terms of innovation, right? So competition is is ultimately good for us. Um, so it means we get the best products at the end of the day to do our science on. Um, so that's why we're looking at alternatives to to x86, specifically Intel. Um, but why ARM then? You know, there there are other options. Um, so ARM is kind of interesting. It's the architecture and a lot of the ecosystem and technologies around the actual processor are, have been driven by the, the fast growing mobile space, right? So the numbers, if you look at how many ARM based processors are shipping every year, it's, you know, huge numbers. We're talking billions every year. So there's a lot of development going into the ecosystem and the technologies around the processors, um, which is really exciting, right? So there's, there's lots of innovation happening there and we want to try and um, see how we can exploit that for the HPC space as well. The other thing that's really interesting about ARM and, and really quite important um, going back to this, this question of competition is that ARM themselves, the company ARM, do not um, produce and sell processes, right? They um, define the instruction set and they build up the ecosystem and technologies around it, but their business model relies on there being um, multiple vendors who then license the ARM instruction set and design and build ARM-based processes um, with it, right? So they're relying on there being multiple ARM-based processor vendors out there that are trying to ship um, ship processes to, to guys like us. So we, we also have competition between the different ARM processor vendors as well as between ARM and x86 and, and power and all that sort of thing. Um, so again, that means we get more choice. Um, it potentially pushes more innovations through the system. So we're going to talk a bit about the, the vector instruction set stuff that's happening as well a little later on in the talk. Um, but all these reasons are, are, are why we're interested in what's happening with ARM based processors for HPC. Um, so jumping on. So this is the system. So uh, this is this is what Isambard looks like. This is the, the system as installed in the MetOffice data center. This is what we've got. So it's a full um, cabinet. And these things are pretty dense nowadays. So it is just a single cabinet. Uh, but we've got 10,000 cores packed into this thing. Um, nice characteristic picture of Isambard Kingdom Brunel on the side, as well as all the logos. Uh, this is what we're working with. And if I jump to the system specs here, um, so as I say, we've got just over 10,000 ARM V8 cores. So these are 64-bit ARM processors. I'll talk a bit about the processor specifically in, in a little uh, while. Um, that equates to just over 160 nodes. So we've got a few login nodes and other bits. So it's 164 nodes available for compute. And each one is a dual socket Cavium Thunder X2 processor. So 32 cores per socket running at 2.1 gigahertz. So we're talking quite high core counts here. Um, 256 gigabytes of DDR4 memory per node as well, um, as well as half a petabyte of Lustre storage alongside that. So as I mentioned, this is all in a Cray XC50 form factor. So this is Cray's Scout system. Um, and I'll say also, we, we, were, we are the, the very first um, XC50 Scout system that Cray have produced. Right? So it's, it's a bleeding edge system. Um, so we're kind of leading the way here with Cray um, to kind of prove out these technologies for them. And, and actually in, in recent weeks, we've heard announcements of other people now, other institutions uh, buying pretty much the same system. So it's it's looking like this is definitely a viable product for real HPC procurements. So because it's Cray, this is the other interesting thing, um, because it's Cray, it has the Aries interconnect. So Cray's Aries in interconnect, which is also in Archer. Um, so we know we should have a very um, high performance interconnect that scales well to high core counts, high node counts. Um, and it also means we have the full Cray HPC optimized software stack. And this was really important to us. We've, we've dabbled with ARM before, as I mentioned. And um, one, of the, one of the big questions that there's always been in the past is, 
how well the, the tool chains are doing, right? How well the compilers um, and the math libraries and all those sorts of things are doing. So, you know, if we don't see such good performance, is that because there's actually a problem with the processor or or do we really, are we really missing something in the tools? So knowing that we have the full Cray HPC software stack on there, so we're talking the Cray compilers, the Cray math libraries, all the Cray performance analysis tools, that's really important for us to, um, to answer that question. Um, so for a technology comparison point of view, we also have phase one of the system, which we've had for, for about 18 months now, which has a very small number of nodes of everything else. We've got some Broadwell x86, we've got some Skylake coming soon, and some AMD stuff in the pipeline as well. We've got some Intel Knights Landing, we've got some Power 9 with Volta GPUs, and we've got some Pascal GPUs as well. Um, so that's also in Isambar, just to do some kind of node level performance comparisons between all that and um, the Thunder X2 stuff. But the interesting bit, that's phase two. Um, that's what we refer to as phase two. So that's the this full cabinet of 10,000 cores of ARM stuff that was installed pretty recently. So because it's a bleeding edge system, there were a few delays. So we're a little bit behind some of the other tier two centers. Um, but that was installed and accepted just before SC18. So if you're at SC18, you may have seen some of the announcements and presentations about that. Uh, but that is now up and running. We're currently in the process of bringing it up and configuring it for real production use. So hopefully in the near future, you'll be able to start applying for time on it. Um, and because it's a tier two system funded by EPSRC, um, that means 25% of the machine time will be available to EPSRC researchers from across the UK via the, um, via the tier two RAP process. So that's the same process you go through basically for requesting time on Archer or any of the other tier twos. Um, you'll be able to do exactly the same thing to, to request time on Isambard as well. Um, so this is what a blade of Isambard looks like. I mentioned it's it's quite a dense system, so we've got the full 10,000 cores packed into one of those cabinets. Um, so this is one of the blades, and it basically has four nodes on it. Um, so you can see going from back to front, you've got um, pairs of sockets covered by those heat sinks. Um, so four of those, and you can see all the, the RAM around it as well. So I'll talk a bit about um, the number of mem memory channels we've got, which is quite important from a performance point of view. Um, but so four nodes per blade and all the Aries um, and other bits at the front of the blade as well. So very dense um, system we've got here. So this is the processor. So it's Cavium Thunder X2, and actually Cavium have fairly recently been um, acquired by Marvell, so you may see this now referred to as Marvell Thunder X2, but it is the same thing. Um, so one thing to really highlight here is that you've probably heard of ARM processes um, for lots of other reasons, right? ARM is almost certainly what's in your mobile phone. You'll probably have one in your washing machine, maybe your toaster, your car, that kind of thing. Um, so they're, they're usually quite well known for being fairly small, fairly lightweight, low power, um, not really high performance. And, and the thing to kind of point out here is that, you know, this is not the same kind of ARM processor that you have in your mobile phone, right? This is a very high end, high performance core designed for server and HPC class processing, right? So it's designed to be high performance. Um, so that's why we've got these high core counts, 32 cores per socket that can run at up to 2.5 gigahertz. Um, and each core itself, again, is not a lightweight core. It's quite a heavyweight uh, processor core has all the same kind of character characteristics you'd expect from other processes. So it's four-way superscalar, it's out of order. Um, it's got 32K L1 cache, it's got 256L2 per core, and a shared 32 meg L3 cache. Uh, each core has two 128-bit wide uh, neon units. This is uh, kind of similar to AVX, although it's slightly narrower than AVX. So Skylake, you've got 512 bits, ball bells 256 bits. We'll talk a bit about how this actually affects real application codes um, when we get to the results in a minute. But one of the really interesting things and one of the reasons why we are particularly interested in this processor specifically is that it has eight channels of um, DDR4 memory per socket, right? So that's compared to six on Skylake or four on Broadwell. Um, so it's the same as Epic as it happens. So um, what this means is that the processors have um, noticeably higher memory bandwidth, right? So this is this is important because the recent trends have shown that for lots of real applications, lots of real scientific workloads, it's actually, it's not a case of how fast can you do all the floating point computation, it's how fast can you actually get your data sets um, onto the chip from memory and back and the results back into memory. Um, so we do see the effects of this again on the, on the application results that I'll show you a little later on. 
so we've done some benchmarking and that's what I want to spend the, the bulk of the talk really talking about is our is our results so we've got a few benchmarking platforms that we've looked at here um, we initially did a lot of single node comparison so before we had the full isambard system which we've only had for a few weeks um, we had some early access platforms where you could do lots of single node architecture comparisons so these are the four platforms that we're going to compare um, for the next few slides um, so at the top we've got a broadwell system so that's a high-end broadwell pretty much top bin dual socket 22 core running at 2.2 gigahertz um, we've then got a couple of skylake platforms so we've got a top bin sorry a couple of skylake platforms we've got the top bin skylake platinum system um, so the two socket uh, 28 core system but we've also got a, a skylake gold so the, the dual socket 20 core system above that um, the reason being that the skylake gold is actually uh, more like the kind of system that people are actually buying. So if you look at some of the, the other systems in the UK that are using Skylake, um, there's a tier two CSD3 system in Cambridge, that's a Skylake Gold. Um, the reason for this is simply the price of the Skylake Platinums. If you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see just how much the list price is for those Skylake Platinum chips. And, and that's why, at least for HPC, that these, these um, processors are not really being used so much. So Skylake Gold is a more realistic um, target to compare against. And then the Thunder X2 at the bottom, that's a dual socket 32 core. It's not quite exactly the same as what we have in Isambard, but it's it's pretty close. So same number of cores, very slightly higher core clock, very slightly lower memory clock. Um, but otherwise, it's it's pretty close to what we've now got in Isambard. So it gives a pretty good indication of what node level performance will look like. So just to talk through a few of the, the specs, um, the ones that are interesting and, and show up in the application results. Um, so as we've already mentioned, this is um, it's, it's got quite a high core count compared to any of the x86 systems. So 32 cores per socket gives you 64 per node. Um, so higher than even the Skylake Platinums um, and noticeably higher than, than a lot of the Broadwell systems out there. Flops does suffer, however. So second um, group from the left. So because of the, the narrower um, vector units because it's neon which is 128 bit and we do see a big difference in the floating point throughput particularly compared to Skylake which is 512 bit um, so if you have a code that is very sensitive to floating point performance you may see the effects of this um, with Broadwell there's not such a big difference so even though Broadwell the vectors are twice as wide um, the higher core counts in Thunder X2 means it actually catches up quite a bit there and then just jumping to the very right hand side of the graph the memory bandwidth um, as I mentioned, this is the other the key characteristic of Thunder X2 is because it has eight memory channels, you'd expect to see a uh, much higher memory bandwidth to DDR memory. And so these numbers are the stream triad benchmark. Um, so running at the, the 2500 megahertz memory clock, we do see significantly higher memory bandwidth, measured memory bandwidth compared to Skylake and Broadwell. And then um, in this graph, we've also got in the middle, we've also got measured numbers to L1, L2, and L3 caches. Um, so you can see actually the, the results here are kind of mixed. So for L1, um, we are being hit a little bit on Thunder X2 compared to Broadwell and Skylake. And this is also actually related to the, the narrower vectors. So um, typically when a processor vendor increases the, the vector width, um, they'll also increase the data paths into L1 cache so they can actually feed those vectors with data. Um, so you do actually see a difference in performance to L1 cache uh, bandwidth. For L2, it flattens out a bit, and L3, again, it, it becomes a little more uniform. Um, uh, but this, again, potentially does show up in some of the application results that we'll talk about in a second. So what is Isambard's core mission? So this kind of um, informs us on what kind of things we should actually be benchmarking. We didn't just want to take an arbitrary set of benchmarks and, and run them. Um, the core mission for Isambard is really looking at, can you deploy ARM processors for a production HPC for a real HPC service, can you use these things? Um, so the way we started or the way we went about this is to start by looking at what applications and what workloads people are actually running on Archer today, right? What are people running on the national HPC service? And how well do these things translate to uh, to Isambard or to, to ARM and Thunder X2 processes? Um, so we've got the list there on the slide at the top. Um, it's the usual suspects. Some of you on the on the webinar may well be running these codes today. So VASP, CASTEP, Gromax, CP2K, the Unified Model, NAMD, OpenSBLI, and NEMO. So these were kind of our, our main targets or our initial targets. Um, 
And at the bottom, we've got a few other codes that we're also interested in working on. So things like open foam, which is also used on, on Archer. Um, so we've, we've taken what we think is a relatively representative set of real application workloads and looked at how well these things um, run on Isambard. So I'll jump straight into the results um, for single node performance. So this is comparing the four systems that I've previously, previously introduced, so Broadwell, Skylake, um, Skylake Gold, Skylake Platinum, and the Thunder X2 systems. So this is all single node, just to be clear. Um, there's a lot on this slide, so I'll talk through it. And again, please do ask any questions in the chat if you have any. Um, so we're comparing performance normalized to Broadwell. So Broadwell we're kind of using as the baseline here. Um, so that's sitting at one across the board, and then higher is better. So it's performance normalized to Broadwell, higher is better across the four platforms. Um, so you can see the results are fairly mixed across the board, right? It's, it's not a uniform set of results here. Um, and we kind of expect this based on the fact that there's um, different performance characteristics um, on the processes for different areas. So things like memory bandwidth and floating point compute. Um, so if we look at, I guess, the good to start with, the, the codes that we'd expect to be very sensitive to memory bandwidth, and the usual candidates for this are things like CFD codes, um, structured grid codes, stencil codes, this sort of thing. So open foam and open SBLI um, fit quite nicely into this category. And if you look at the performance we're getting relative to Broadwell and even Skylake um, for open foam, we're seeing a noticeable improvement in actual real application performance. And this actually roughly correlates to the stream triad bandwidth that we've previously shown. Um, so this is actually more or less what we'd expect. So it's a good result for Thunder X2. Um, open SBLI, similar story, although it is just nudged out there at the top by Skylake Platinum. Um, so this may happen if, for example, um, the, the caches start to have a bit more effect. Um, you may see um, you lose a little bit of performance on Thunder X2, but overall, you know, it's still matching uh, these top bin Skylake Platinum chips. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the codes where we wouldn't expect Thunder X2 to do so well. So codes where floating point performance or maybe L1 cache bandwidth are quite important. So um, these ones are things like Gromax, second from the left, and VASP on the right there. Um, you know, these, these are codes where we know they spend a lot of time either in uh, BLAS or FFT routines or in handwritten vector intrinsics and are very sensitive to L1 cache bandwidth and that sort of thing. So these are codes we wouldn't expect to do so well, um, and indeed they don't, right? So we see we're taking maybe a 30% or 25 to 30% performance hit versus the top bin Broadwell systems here. Um, but even so, you know, that's we're, we're still in the right ballpark here. We're not talking an order of magnitude slower. We're, we're um, just taking a bit of a hit on the places where we'd expect to take a bit of a hit. And for the other codes, they, they actually sit somewhere in between those two points, right? So things like CP2K, um, Unified Model, which is obviously quite a complex code, uh, Nemo, NAMD. Um, so these codes have, you know, they're not straightforward memory bandwidth bound. They're not straightforward floating point compute bound. They sit somewhere in the middle. Maybe some parts of them are memory, memory bandwidth sensitive, but other parts are sensitive to cache performance. Um, so they actually sit somewhere in the middle. So competitive with um, Skylake is, is the phrase I'd use. Um, but not, ne not necessarily beating it in all cases. And that's OK, right? We don't need to um, be winning in every benchmark. We don't need to have uh, superior performance in every benchmark. Um, we just need to be uh, broadly competitive, right? So the geo mean on the right is, is the geo mean of all these results. You can see we're, on average, 15% faster than the top bin Broadwell, a little bit slower than the Skylake Gold and Skylake Platinum, uh, but we're still pretty much competitive for a, for a real range of real scientific workloads, right? Um, so actually, even aside from performance, one of, the, one of the other real tests here was, can we actually even take a, a, a large set of real scientific codes, real scientific workloads, and run them, you know, get the right results? Because that's obviously quite important. Um, and, and the answer was yes, right? We found actually the software stack, the software ecosystem, and I'll talk a bit about this later, but the, you know, the software ecosystem was actually quite robust. In a lot of these cases, we didn't have to do much work at all to get these codes up and running uh, on ARM, which is a really great sign. And the other thing I'll just highlight here is we've, we've also tried to make this work as open and reproducible as possible. So on the, on the bottom of the slide on the left there, there's a link to um, a GitHub repository, which is where we've been putting essentially all of our scripts for um, both building these benchmarks and running them on all of these platforms, right? As well as the actual, um, the output files, the raw output files for all the results, right? So we, ha we haven't just given you some arbitrary numbers here. You can actually go and either look at 
the output files and results for yourself. So even if you have access to any of these platforms or similar platforms, you should be able to run them um, for yourselves as well and, and see at least how we've compiled and run them. Um, so we've had a lot of positive feedback in this area. So if you do want to check this stuff out, um, please go ahead. And if you have any feedback or questions, just get in touch with me. Um, and we'll be continuing to update the, that repository and those scripts as we move forward for the, the real Isambard system. So we'll update them for, for the Isambard phase two nodes and also um, for the scaling results. Um, as they come in, we'll start adding scripts and results for those as well. So in summary, for that slide, essentially, we've got, um, as I've mentioned, performance is, is basically competitive, I'd say, with state-of-the-art Intel processors. Um, it's faster when we'd expect it to be faster. So it's faster when memory bandwidth is um, the key factor. Um, but it is slower in some cases when flops and or L1 cache bandwidth are quite critical. Right? So it, it, it performs essentially as we'd expect it to perform um, at the moment, which is, which is encouraging. Right? Um, the other thing I point out here, and that's quite important for thinking about future ARM-based systems. So we are already um, thinking about this. We're doing a lot of work with the processor vendors to see um, what's coming up next. Um, and the good news on that second point about the flops in L1 cache bandwidth is that the next generation ARM CPUs um, will essentially address this by increasing flops and cache bandwidth. And that comes in the form of something called SVE. So ARM have announced <clears throat> maybe last year or even earlier on this thing called the scalable vector extensions. Um, which will increase um, the vector width from NEON, which is 128, to a vector width of up to 2048 bits, although in practice it will probably be much smaller for HPC chips. Um, so, for example, the Fujitsu A64FX chip, which is um, going into um, the Recon's post-K machine in the next couple of years, uh, that's a 512-bit SVE chip, and we're expecting 512 bits to be quite a common choice for server-based ARM processors. So that will actually match... Um, things like AVX512 on Skylake and, and KNL and things like that. So when these processors hit, and you know this will be in the next couple of years, um, that should address this uh, performance gap with the floating point performance and um, L1 cache bandwidth, right? Um, so that will make these things even more compelling um, to use for HPC workloads as well. So I'll just talk briefly about the, the software ecosystem. Um, I've already mentioned we've had quite positive experiences with um, the ARM software ecosystem. So the um, situation today is a lot better than it was a few years ago when we started looking at this stuff. So in terms of the compilers, there are three fairly mature compiler suites now. So the GNU toolchain, of course, um, GCC, G++, G Fortran, that's all there. That's been, um, that's been probably the most stable uh, because that's been proven out by, again, all the ARM stuff that's been happening in the other spaces, such as mobile. Um, the ARM HPC compilers are pretty good as well, we found. So this is LLVM and Clang-based stuff, as well as using the, um, the Flang uh, front end that's been um, pushed a lot by PGI and NVIDIA. Um, that's probably the only component that I'd say has a little bit more work to do, but otherwise the ARM HPC compilers are pretty good. Um, and of course, because it's a Cray, we've got the Cray compiling environment, which has also been very stable, um, delivering pretty good performance um, in a lot of cases as well. Um, so we've got three mature compiler stacks. Math libraries, it's also a pretty good situation. So you've got the open source route with OpenBlaz, um, which Cavium themselves have contributed a lot of performance uh, improvements to for their processes specifically, as well as FFTW. Um, ARM themselves have a bunch of performance libraries. So they've got Blaz and Lepak and um, FFT stuff in their performance libraries. That also works very well. We're seeing um, some good performance improvements with the latest versions of that as well. Um, and again, Cray, of course, have Cray's map libraries. That's all ported to ARM with Cray's FFTW uh, port. Um, so again, it's, it's good to have a lot of choice here between different compilers and different uh, library suites. Um, and the tools are pretty good as well, right? So um, I don't know if, if many of you know this, but um, Alinea was bought by ARM in the last couple of years. So Alinea map and Alinea DDT um, are now provided by ARM. So they've been ported to the ARM systems. Um, in the form of ARM Forge. Um, so all those tools that you may have used on other systems are now available on um, systems like Isambard and other ARM systems. Um, as, again, the Cray stuff is all there as well. So CrayPat or Perf tools, um, the Cray debuggers, all the tools you'd expect to see on a system like Archer, you'll also see on Isambard, right? So if, in fact, if, you, if you're an Archer user, if you log into Isambard, 
it'll be hard to tell the difference for the most part, right? You'll see exactly the same set of modules. It will look and feel very similar. Um, so it should be easy enough to get up and running. So that's um, really positive. So the software ecosystem, as far as we're concerned, um, is not a concern anymore for ARM. It's, it's there, it's continuing to mature and continuing to improve, but it is already in a very good state um, that lets us run, build and run real scientific workloads on it. So I'll just talk a bit more about the compilers actually. So um, we've done a lot of comparisons and we've done this single node benchmarking between the different compilers and math library um, suites. So we tried to be quite rigorous about this. So for all the platforms, not just Thunder X2, but for the x86 ones as well, um, we took each benchmark and we tried to build and run it with all of the different compilers that were available on those systems. And, and whichever one was the best, that was the result that we used in that previous graph. Uh, right, so we haven't just picked you know, an arbitrary choice. We've tried all, everything that we can. Um, and this this table here just shows you which ones of those compilers were the best for each particular benchmark on each particular platform. Um, and you can see it jumps about a lot um, for all the platforms actually, right? So um, again, this kind of highlights the fact that, that having this choice, having these at least three different choices is proving quite beneficial because there's no one compiler that jumps out as being the winner in all cases. And again, that's the same on the x86 systems. Um, so having the three different compiler suites here has been uh, very useful um, for getting the best performance out of these, these chips. And again, in our benchmarking repository, that GitHub link on the right, um, we've included the scripts for all of these different compilers, right? So not just the best one, we've got the scripts for um, all of the compilers and different combinations of compilers and math libraries that we tried. Um, so you can check that out as well. Um, and just to dive into the ARM ones as well, actually, a bit more specifically. So um, this is now comparing for, for all the benchmarks and a few extra mini apps at the top, the performance we get for those different compiler suites, right? Uh, normalized to whichever compiler gave the best performance. Um, um, so what maybe jumps out initially is, is the red spots, right? So it, it's not perfect, and actually it isn't perfect on x86 either, but there are some cases where um, these compilers, or at least the versions that we were using when we generated these results earlier in the year, um, either failed to build or produce code that didn't quite work correctly. Right? So um, there are still some, some areas for improvement. But actually, most of these issues, in fact, almost all of these issues are, are identical on x86 systems. In fact, I think the circle is probably inaccurate. I think um, the build failure for, for CP2K is actually a flang-based failure that would happen on, on x86 as well. So um, there isn't anything here that's specific to ARM that's concerning from, um, it's just that some of these codes are quite big and old and, and hard to, to um, compile correctly for some of these um, suites. So there's some build failures, uh, but it, in terms of performance, if you look at the actual numbers, um, it's actually pretty good across the board. So um, there's not really many cases or any cases where performance is really lagging significantly behind for any one compiler. There's a few um, 25, 30% regressions in one or two places. Um, and generally our experience has been in fact, you can see it's, it's usually Cray that's ahead in those cases. Um, that's a result of the other compilers not being so good at um, vectorization. So Cray have a long history of um, generating very efficient vector code from their compiler. Um, so we found that does help in some of these cases. Things like the Snap Mini app um, is quite sensitive to that. Um, but otherwise, performance is looking pretty good across the board for all these compilers. So we're, we're going to continue doing this work. And I think you know some of these are already some of these results are already quite old, so uh, we're going to try and refresh these now with the latest versions of all the compilers and see where we currently stand. Um, and again, we'll keep updating that in our benchmarks repository. Um, so do get in touch if you have any questions about any of that stuff. So for the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, scaling results that we've done. So this is much newer than the, the single node benchmarking comparisons we've done um, because we've only had the full ISMBAR system for um, just over a month now, in fact, it was accepted 9th of November. So we've tried to take at least some of these real applications and real scientific workloads and run them at scale on the full um, Isambard system, right? So running up to the full 10,000 cores, 160 nodes, both to make sure the system actually works, of course. Again, that's quite important. Can you run these apps at scale, get the right answers and all that kind of stuff, uh, but also to test scaling performance on Thunder X2 with, with the Aries Interconnect that we've got. So I'll show a few a few results of the next few slides um, that show this, and we're going to plot results just for Thunder X2 at the moment because we haven't had a chance to go through and do 
all of these on all the different platforms yet, but for Thunder X2, we're going to show um, scaling efficiency. So starting at one or two nodes, we're strong scaling these codes up to um, well, basically as far as we can, so 160 nodes in a few cases. Um, and I'll just, again, highlight as a, as a disclaimer here, these are very early results. So in fact, these are all results we generated in the few days in between accepting the system and presenting the results at SC18. So we haven't had a lot of time for these results to tune performance, to you know, trial the different options you might want to try when trying to get good performance at scale. Um, we expect the results to improve further as we continue to work on them. And in fact, already some of these results I know we've managed to improve since the versions that are on these slides today. So these things will get better. But just to give you a flavor for, for where we're currently at or where we were at a few weeks ago. Um, so with that disclaimer in mind, we'll start with the uniform. A uh, UM test case that was provided by the Met Office. So this is version 10.4 of the unified model um, running an N76A configuration, which will hopefully mean something to, to some of you that are working with the UM. Um, but we can see scaling efficiency as we go up from, I think, two or four nodes was the minimum up to the full 160 nodes drops to 50% um, efficiency, right? Um, which might sound quite low, but actually. Again, this is, we're talking quite high call counts here, 10,000 calls. So running this test case up to that, that sort of scale, 50% um, efficiency is actually a pretty good start. And again, we know this performance is going to improve um, as we start to harden the software stacks and tune everything that we can on the system. So um, we're quite pleased with the performance already. Um, so 50% efficiency at 160 nodes. Um, and again, it's all it was all looking very robust, right? So it wasn't hard work to do this. The Met Office basically just took their production codes, production workloads. Uh, build it on the system and ran it, and it all just worked essentially. So, I'm uh, very encouraging for running real um, science at scale on Isambard. I'll jump through to the next one, which is Nemo. Um, so, this is um, one of the standard Nemo configurations, the Pisces configuration um, with a 1 12th of a degree resolution, um, just running up to 8,192 calls for this one. So, this one doesn't scale as well up to 128 nodes. Um, but I'm pretty sure we've started to do this on x86 and see that also um, for the x86 systems, this particular configuration isn't scaling um, that great either. Um, so there might be a bit more work to do here um, to find out what's really going on. But again, the performance we're seeing overall um, is roughly what we'd expect. It's in the right ballpark. And again, it's it's working at, at scale. Everything is is quite robust with this benchmark, so that was all good. Moving along to OpenSBLI, so again, one of the, the, the big codes that's run on Archer today. Um, this one's one of our best results in terms of scaling. So going up to, again, the full 160 nodes, 10,000 calls, um, we're seeing 66% efficiency at, at that scale um, for this benchmark. Again, if you want any of the details about exactly which workloads we're running, um, not all of the details are on the slide. So please just ask me, we'll get in touch. Uh, and we can provide all the details. I think this one's the, the 1024 cubed benchmark, which is actually the same one that's used for the, the Archer benchmarks that Andy Turner has been doing at EPCC. Um, so this one's scaling pretty well as well. Uh, and then Gromax, which is actually one of the codes which was doing um, not so well for the single node benchmarking, but actually also scales uh, pretty well here. This is a 42 million atom test case, again, taken from the Archer benchmarks that Andy Turner has been working on. Um, this one scales pretty well, and actually our initial comparisons to x86 are showing that even though on a single node it's not um, comparing so favorably, by the time you get up to scale, um, it actually closes the gap quite a lot, right? Um, because more of the runtime starts going into the comms and things like that. Um, so you see it close the gap quite favorably when you get up to these sorts of scales. So I think that was my last scaling result. Um, so at this point, I'll conclude. So what we've shown with the single node performance results and uh, now some of the scaling results that are just coming in hot off the press, um, Thunder X2 performance is competitive with essentially the latest state of the art processes from other vendors. You know, it's sometimes faster, it's sometimes a little bit slower, but on the whole, it is competitive. It's in the same ballpark. Um, and if you take those list prices into account, right, the, the actual cost of the CPU, the performance per dollar, it actually is quite compelling, right? So you can kind of do the experiment for yourselves. If you take our performance numbers and normalize them with respect to the prices, um, you'll see kind of why we're really interested in doing this stuff. It's performance per dollar is 
um, really quite important here. The software ecosystem is in a good shape. Um, as I say, there's lots of different options out there for compilers, for math libraries, uh, for all the tools. So we found it's been really quite straightforward in porting these real scientific workloads onto the system and getting them up and running. It's been, in almost all cases, uh, no more effort than it was on any other you know, x86 or power system that you might have used, um, which is really encouraging. And so the Isambard system itself is, we've kind of gone through the initial, bring up the initial benchmarking phase, um, and we're now just configuring it for um, our initial early real science users from the GW4 institutions. We're going to have them on next week, hopefully, uh, running some real science codes. And very soon after that, we can start to open up the system to researchers from across the UK. Right. So um, if you're interested in running some real science on Isambard, please do get in touch and we can um, let you know when it's available for that. It will be through the tier two wrap process, as I mentioned. Um, so as far as we're concerned, the signs are that, that ARM-based systems are very much um, viable alternatives for, for HPC, right? And so it, it introduces this competition or reintroduces this competition that we really need. Um, and there's been a whole bunch of news recently from other sites, um, both in Europe and in the US and other sites around the world that are starting to um, actually buy and, and bring up ARM-based systems as well. So all the signs are there that this is um, really going to start to take off over the next few years. Um, so on my last slide, there are a few links there to um, some of the works we've done on this. There's a paper at the top for some of the single node benchmarking comparisons, which is already very much out of date. Um, there'll be an updated paper going into a journal very, very soon. Um, and by the time that comes out, it'll also be out of date. Um, but again, you can see all our kind of live progress in the benchmarks repository um, at the bottom there. So with that, I think I'll end 45 minutes in. Um, and if you have any questions, please do let me know. So thanks, James. So um, people um, are welcome to ask questions. You can uh, normally the thing that works best is the chat. There's a chat window at the bottom, which I can um, um, you can um, you can type into. Uh, you're welcome to try and use. Um, um, you can welcome to try and use the. Um, uh, the audio as well, but that's not not, not so reliable. But the chat is uh, very useful. So uh, oh, there's a question for Fiona already. Can you can you see the question, uh, James? Yeah, I've just got onto there now actually. Um, so do I know what the issues with CP2K were? I guess if you're referring to, I'll just go back to the slide. If you're if you're referring to the build failure here with CP2K on uh, with the ARM compiler, um, that's essentially a Fortran front-end issue. So this is the the ARM HPC compilers are using the Flang, a Flang-based Fortran front-end. So Flang is pretty new. It was only really um, open sourced. It, I think it was last summer. Um, so it's a pretty new Fortran. Uh, sorry, pretty new front-end. It's still uh, maturing, and so there's some known issues with. Um, building certain codes with it. So I think the the specific bugs that were found with compiling CP2K with Flang have been reported either to either to ARM or to um, PGI directly on the GitHub repository, but they're not specific to um, to ARM. I know that much, right? So it's, it's just a uh, front-end issue there. Will VASP scale as well as Gromax? Good question. <clears throat> so we've done some initial work with VASP and I think our initial results are no, but not worse than on an x86. So, <laughs> I, so I'm not a VASP expert. We've got our VASP leads in Bath, and, and the particular VASP workloads that we're looking at are known to not scale very well anyway. Right. So um, the initial results that I've seen show that it, it doesn't scale worse than on other systems, if, if that makes sense. Um, so that's, that's all the information I have at the moment. We'll, we'll certainly keep working on that. And as soon as we've got um, results across all the systems, we'll, um, we'll make those available to everyone as well. Um, so the other question from Fiona, are there, any, uh, are there any things that ARM chips are really bad at compared with regular HPC type systems? Um, 
So really the only thing that I, that I highlighted a little bit was the fact that these particular processes have significantly lower floating point throughput um, due to the narrower vector units, the neon versus PVX, um, which also relates to the lower L1 cache bandwidth. So if you're running systems where you're um, managing to fit the data sets in L1 cache, or they're very compute intensive, so things like VASP and, and Gromax potentially, um, these are the only codes where we're really seeing um, lower performance on ARM as a result of that. There's nothing else about the processes that really stands out as being um, problematic compared to um, the regular systems that you're talking to, so x86 and, and other, other chips, at, at least as far as we, we've seen so far. I guess the other kind of workloads um, that you'd expect um, to, to not play so well are things that are very good on GPU. So if you're trying to do something like deep learning, um, you know, TensorFlow type jobs, you know, that, that's not something you'd really want to do on an ARM-based system like Isambard. I'd definitely go to Jade, for example, the other tier two center that's a dense GPU system. So, so anything like that, um, I wouldn't expect to do so well on Isambard. So do I think ARM um, might be a candidate to replace Archer? Um, so I'll answer a little more generally than talking about Archer, um, because I know a lot of the, the, the processes for Archer are already underway, and I'm quite close to Simon McIntosh Smith, who's um, leading a lot of that work. But in general, do I think ARM is a candidate to, or, or candidate for future tier one and maybe tier zero systems? And I think absolutely yes, right? So um, what we've seen coming down the pipeline for the next generation ARM CPUs um, from not just Cavium, but also the Fujitsu chips. Um, and there are others coming in the market as well. So things like Ampere and, and other vendors are all, are all pushing forward with these sorts of things. Um, the next generation ARM chips that will have things like SVE, so the wider vector units, um, and also high bandwidth memory on the chip. We know Fujitsu is going to have you know, a terabyte a second of memory bandwidth um, on the socket itself. Um, so these sorts of chips, I think, absolutely will be um, very viable candidates for future tier one and tier zero systems, right? And so we know Fujitsu, the A64FX, is, that's going to be essentially a tier zero system in, in Japan. So there's no reason why we can um, do the same sort of thing in, in the UK and Europe for, for our future tier one and tier zero systems. And, and as I say, the software ecosystem, that was really the bit that was been holding us back. Um, that's the, pretty much there now, as far as I'm concerned. So, so yes, is I guess the, the answer, the short answer. So um, I think that's all the questions. It's a good, good set of questions there. Um, if there are no further questions. So um, so that was excellent. Thanks a lot, James. Um, I was worried that um, this was you know, quite late on in the day and um, dark times just before going off for Christmas holidays. But we had well over 20 people in the session. So I'm, I'm pleased that people are interested in this. It is very important to, you know, for all of us to know about what the, the diversity and opportunities are. And hopefully there'll be more of these systems coming available at Isambard. And we have our own system here at Edinburgh. Catalyst won't be as open as Isambard, but um, hopefully people will get on there um, and, and, and start porting code to this new architecture. And it's one of these things, things feed on themselves. The more, the more that people use compilers and try them out and kick the tires the the better they get and the more effort the manufacturers Absolutely. and vendors make to making them efficient so it really is a virtuous circle to get on these machines and and it, it, things that can be a bit tough at the start when everything isn't, isn't is, but they're also interesting but it means that things get better so again really like to thank james for that talk um there will be a recording online um, with the slides will go up. Uh, it takes a little while for, for Claire to process them, but it will be available soon. So I'd just like to thank everyone for attending, particularly James, for giving us this really interesting talk. And uh, good luck with everything in the new year. Thanks a lot. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone else as well.